immigration, I, I guess if you had asked me before I knew anything, I would have said, well, you know, people sponsor relatives. Somehow you, you go to the immigration service and say, I've got a brother back in another country. Can they get a visa? That's how most people understand it. And that's true. That is a big part of immigration, what we call family-based immigration. Right? But actually, uh, more people come to the United States on what are called temporary visas than on permanent visas. They come here to, to work, um, and those are high-skilled workers usually. And they come here to study. Again, it usually requires a high skill um, that you're studying in college, right? But this is a huge part of the huge part of the immigration system in terms of who sets foot here, whether or not they're supposed to stay. Okay? So you come here because you work because you're working at um, a computer software place. There are these H-1B visas you may have heard of that are high-skilled people. They often are people from India or China. They come and they can work for, I think, six years on a special visa, temporary visa. Same thing, corporations can bring in high-skilled people on temporary visas. And the problem is, the, this huge category of visas, it's all for high-skilled workers. So Mexicans don't fit in that. Because you look at the population of Mexico, and, and I mean, as you know, on average, the education levels are low. So a huge chunk of our immigration system is irrelevant to Mexicans. It just doesn't fit them. Now we go over to the system of uh, permanent visas, okay? There's a bunch of permanent visas in the United States. We started uh, creating them in 1990 that you don't need any family here to get these visas. You know, and a visa, by the way, is a stamp in your passport that says you have a right to live in the United States. Okay? You have a right to enter the United States. That's what a visa is. Okay, a big chunk of our permanent visas, they're set aside for high school workers again. For jobs that require a bachelor's degree. Doesn't work for Mexicans again. Right? The, the traditional family reunification visa system. Let's look how that works. There's no limit to people who can come in to the United States if their sponsor is a citizen, U.S. citizen spouse, or a U.S. citizen uh, parent of a minor child. There's no limit on it. But you know what? To, to, to go through this uh, immediate relative of citizens, you need sponsors. Sponsors have to be U.S. citizens. Now, if I look at the, the, Mexican the Mexican population in the United States, the Mexican immigrant population, very few people are naturalized, naturalized U.S. citizens. So they can't, they can't use this, this system to um, get a visa for their, for their wife. It just doesn't work. You've got you to be, be a citizen. And how do you get to be a citizen? Well, you have to have documentation, first of all, to get legal uh, permanent status. So again, I'm, I'm chopping out the immigration system, and there's just no room for Mexicans. In. That's what I'm trying to, to show you. So now we get down to, there's this portion of, of the uh, immigration system that in theory works for uh, people no matter what their educational level is. And, and where you don't have to have a sponsor who's a citizen, although you do need a legal, legal permanent resident sponsor. So you say, okay, fine, that should work. That's going to work for Mexico. So you could be sponsored by a wife, could have, a wife in Mexico could have a husband who's a, a green card holder in the U.S. apply for one of these. And these family sponsored visas, there's a 20,000 cap per year. This was in 1965 they established this. 20,000 per country. So Mexico gets 20,000 and so does Mauritania, so does Mongolia. Give me any other country that starts with an M or an A. Or, Every country in the world, in theory, gets 20,000 visas. It's, it's a system that's it's blind to the economic needs of the United States. And it's, it's blind to the relationships and histories we have with Mexico. I mean, you would think that given that economy I showed you, and the important role of Mexicans, there should be, this thing should have a special little thing coming out here and say, okay, Mexico, 100,000. You know? then you would have a legal immigration system that has a pathway for Mexicans, given who they are, because they don't fit anywhere else. This is why the immigration system is broken. I have told people that sometimes uh, it, you'll hear someone say that Mexicans avoid the legal immigration system. Right? What you should say to them is, the legal immigration system avoids Mexicans. 
there's no way in. That's, that's the situation we have. And that's what comprehensive immigration reform is all about. It's somehow taking this little piece here and kind of expanding that up to get in line with the economy. Uh, how are we doing on time here? Right. Okay, I'm going to go, I, I see if I have another slide or if we're going to back up. Is that, my, is that the only one? Go down one more if you'd be so kind. That way, I think you went up. Go down if you would. Page down. And page down one more time. One, one more time. Oh, we're going up, aren't we? Okay, we've got to go the other direction. I'll tell you when to stop. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. All right. This is the effect of the broken immigration system. That uh, is, is the Midwestern states, okay, that were on that map. And this is, um, the, I forget the years I used. I looked at, of, of Mexican immigrants, I think, who came in between 2000 and 2007. So, something like that. You know, I, that was my parameter. I, I did some estimates of what percent of, of Mexican immigrants coming in appear to be undocumented. And, and we can do this kind of study using census data and comparing it to, to visa numbers. Um, and the result is that in, in most states, especially before the recession, this has probably changed a little bit since the recession and since they built the wall and border control. It's, it's changed a little bit. But the big picture is that the great majority of immigration from Mexico has been undocumented. So it's not true to say that a lot of Mexicans uh, are undocumented. What's true is to say, most new arrivals, most new arrivals are undocumented. That's just how it is, because of all these things I've walked you through. Um, so this is the result of the broken immigration system, which doesn't respond to that economic need, which doesn't respond to those historical patterns. And, and that's what I try to communicate to people about why you have undocumented immigration from Mexico. And th this is where you end up with it. So actually, I think I'll stop there. And um, maybe if you uh, have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. And please. Uh, what What do you call new arrivals? From what From what year? I think, and I'm trying to remember. I think when I I think I wrote this using data. I looked at people who came to the to the states to these states between the year 2000 and 2007 from Mexico. Because you know what? Here's how it works. We have these surveys from the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau does surveys. It's called the American Community Survey. And they go out and they ask people. And you just look at the data, and I'm going to make these numbers up. But here's what you'll find. You'll say, okay, 10,000 people in Iowa said, this is what they said. No one like made them say this. They said, yeah, I'm from Mexico, and uh, I came here since the year 2000. And they fill out their form, as they're supposed to. And, and a guy like me says, okay, 10,000. There are 10,000 Mexicans in Iowa saying they just got here since the year 2000, right? Well, then I go over to the, the USCIS, United States Citizenship and Information Services, and I dig out their numbers and visas. I said, okay, how many visas were given to people from Mexico in Iowa during that same period, right? And there's, they're, they're way out of match. You, the legal visas given out are just a tiny fraction of that bigger number of people who are saying, I'm here. And that's, that's essentially, in a nutshell, how the most sophisticated analyses of, of illegal immigration are done. Um, like this last census we had, just, just as they're supposed to, people's families in, in Chicago filled out and said, no, I'm here, I'm born in wherever, and I just came here. And it's way out of sync with the number of uh, legal immigrant visas we've given out for people coming to Chicago. So that, that's how we get these numbers. Oh, sorry, well, there's a gentleman here and then there's another one in the What's the, like, to this, for 2009, what's the visa cap number? Like, what's the limit? Oh, it's, it is complicated, but um, there's different kinds of visas. And there's these visas for um, temporary workers. And there's different kinds of temporary workers. The most famous temporary immigrant visas <coughs> are these H-1B, H-1B, that... Um, Corporations use for high-skilled workers. They tend to use them for computer programmers or engineers. And uh, Congress keeps fiddling with the cap. But I think, um, I think it's maybe 60000 a year right now. I, I might be wrong about that. That's, that's, there's that kind of cap. Of coming over to the um, family-based immigration side, 
I should know these numbers off the top of my head. There's no cap on people sponsored by citizen close relatives, meaning a parent of a minor child or a spouse. No cap on that. And those numbers annually are 400,000, 500,000. Okay? A year. Yeah, about half a million people, give or take, are sponsored by a close immigrant, a close citizen, U.S. citizen relative. And then the number of that 20,000 these are, these are country quotas. Every country in theory gets 20,000, but there are 100 countries in the world. That they don't all get 20,000 at the end of the day because 20,000 times 100 is a big number that no one is going to allow immigrate to the United States. You're, yeah, we'll come back there. Um, so there's some overall cap on those country by countries that, that adds up to something like half a million. The legal immigration to the United States legal permanent, okay, not just the temporary, because that's legal too. Lots of people are legal immigrants who aren't permanent residents. You know that? A lot of people have, uh, well, the consulate people know this, you have a passport that says, I have a visa, and, that, and even I have work authorization to live in the United States. That doesn't mean you're a legal permanent resident with a green card. And so immigration law is pretty interesting, because there's just all kinds of categories. Um, I got a little distracted here, but uh, I was telling you how many, but... The total legal immigration to United States, it's about 800,000 a year. Get, get permanent residents, permanent residents. And it varies, it's up to a million in some years. I'm sorry, we had a question back. Oh, yes. Uh, you touched on like, the immigration system is important to the uh, economic use of the United States, but uh, the legal immigration system is important to the economic use of the United States. Mexico, Canada, and the United States have famous free trade agreement. So, my question is um, why hasn't been implemented fully, and the other and the second question is, why, since NAFTA, why has it been the military, militarization and criminalization of, Mex of Mexicans, of immigrants? The story with NAFTA is that NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is uh, an agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States to allow um, things produced in one country to cross the border um, a lot easier than they ever would, right? So if I make I make something here in Chicago in a factory. I can, I can sell it in Mexico. And Mexico can sell its agricultural products and other manufactured products here. Very famously, when they, when they pass NAFTA, it, it covers the free movement of everything except human beings. NAFTA doesn't cover human migration. NAFTA said it's very good to send tomatoes across the border. It's easier to send a tomato across the border than a human being. And in fact, the tomatoes that cross the border are cared for much more carefully. <laughs> I'm serious, they're wrapped up, they're kept in refrigerated cars, you know, you don't want to spoil your tomatoes. It's all done very with great loving care when we ship a tomato across the border. There is just no convention or agreement between the United States and Mexico to um, allow legal immigration that somehow is in line with all this economic trade. It's just not there. Yeah, you mentioned about how the U.S. immigration system uh, is actually blind, but my question is, <coughs> is it really blind, or is it that was meant to be so that it can help more Europeans instead of Hispanics? Was it deliberately done in that way? Well, there's two things. There's a history over the last hundred years. If you go back to the 1920s, when, when quotas were put on immigration for the first time, there were no quotas on immigration prior to the 1920s. That's why people who are white who say, my parents came here legally, we just say, well, duh, everybody came legally, because there was no... There was no illegal immigration in the 1800s. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> well, of course they were legal. Um, but um, and, and the system in the 1920s was changed to cut down the number of visas, and of the visas given out, they were really skewed towards Europe. There's no doubt about that. Um, that was ended in 1965. There, there really, in the, in the current um, immigration law we have, there, there's not a bias, per se, Towards, towards white or European immigrants. It really isn't. The problem with immigration law, and this is where there's a de facto bias, because it's not synced up with economic needs, it's a bias against the countries that, that supply our economic workers. For example, Mexico. That's where there's a bias. It's not a legal bias where it's written in there, thou shalt not come in here if you're from Mexico, which it used to say about China. The Chinese Exclusion Act in, in the 1920s said, if you are from China, you cannot come into this country. It's just singled out a country. So we're, we're not doing that anymore. But there's this, as I say, a de facto um, um, 
to bias against Mexico. Someone else have a question? I think there's one other person in the back, or maybe one point. Uh, I have a question. Um, obviously, that all of these are politics, and all of these are uh, policies that have been implemented in Washington, and they're not paying attention to solve these problems. Uh, what it's, uh, it's going to continue giving us all these uh, numbers. Um, in terms of uh, the future, and how to change this, and how these youngsters are committed to, to continue to, to continuously monitoring all of these numbers and try to change the staff, what can they do? What do they need to know about that? You know, it's actually not hopeless, although it is a very difficult situation. Uh, I mean, you, you guys all know the politics in the United States today, even before you talk about immigration. Um, we just came off a recession. The, the economic future of this country is much less clear than it used to be. So everybody really is pretty freaked out in the U.S. These days. Like, where are we going as a country? Is China just going to kick our butt? And that's, that's how the average American feels these days. So um, all that's going on. I mean, nevertheless, we haven't been able to pass comprehensive immigration reform, right? And, and we, we had, a, we had a, the House of Representatives passed the DREAM Act. A majority of uh, senators were ready to vote for it, but we couldn't get the 60 senators needed. I think 54 were going to vote for it. So you know, the, 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 the defeats have been very, um, very upsetting. But um, on the other hand, it came close. And comprehensive immigration reform as a complete package, uh, it died, it, it made it to the Senate and died, I, I forget how many years ago this was now, not very good, five years ago, it came very close. So I mean, the political um, pressure and the political advocacy, it, 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 it can really change things, and you can't give up on that. The way to, the way to, to leverage that is to, is to be involved. You know, um, in, in Chicago, there's the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. Um, you can become involved with them. They're very good at, at uh, pressuring and, and it, uh, a congressmen and, and educating them. They've been using a lot of demographics to show suburban Republican legislators just how many immigrants are in their districts. Because these a lot of these guys think they don't have any immigrants. And so they think, well, I can be real hard on immigration because it's just an easy thing for me to do. It doesn't affect my district. But you know, you go in there and you introduce them to people who are who are part of uh, this broken immigration system. And you know, you just gotta keep working on that. I, I think there is hope. You know, we elected a Democratic president and um, we didn't know that we could do that. Uh, Obama hasn't been able to give us comprehensive immigration reform. I'm certainly glad he's in office, and, and so I think that you know the political process needs to keep uh, getting uh, leveraged, and we all need to keep being involved in it. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the ratification of the economy and the Trump administration. Um, I think legal immigration would smooth out the bifurcated economy. Because for one thing, the low-skilled workers here, a lot of them are trapped in their jobs. If they, if they could sell their human skills on the free market without having an immigration problem, they could move into another one of those bars. But right now they can't. So the, a broken immigration system um, helps to maintain and to some extent perpetuate this, uh, this divide between rich and poor. Um, immigration reform really should be seen as economic development. Uh, here's another example. If I went into a little village, any Mexican neighborhood in the United States today, let's say in South Lawndale, you know, a real lot of adults there uh, are undocumented. If I could wave a magic wand and uh, let people have a legal status, they first of all be able to go and get jobs commensurate with their skills, like I just said. But there's other things they get to do for the first time. They could participate in the financial markets. 
a lot of uh, undocumented folks were able to purchase homes during the last housing boom. They were sold through ITIN-based loans, uh, subprime mortgages. It was a huge waste of money, but I mean, I'm glad people got homes when they wanted a home, and I, you know, I hope they're able to keep it. But uh, when, when, you, when, you're, when you're prevented from participating freely in, in financial markets, in, in human capital markets, and labor markets, it screws things up. And it, and, it, and it makes, I mean, if you're a free market person, you should be totally in favor of, of, of uh, immigration reform because you would let uh, things flow in the economy more. Capital and skills and finance, etc. So that's why immigration reform would lead to economic development. And it would, it would, even in that neighborhood, it certainly would. Hi. Do you think that perhaps uh, why politicians or, uh, or just other powers that be don't want immigration reform? is that the immigrant community might be more willing to organize, uh, such as unions, and want higher wages for their low-skilled jobs? I think that's part of it for sure. I, I think the big question is what's going on with the United States today where so many people are so reactionary on things, including but not limited to immigration, right? Um, you know, the Tea Party and, and, the, and the anger that's in politics today. It's, I think it's a reflection of the the insecurity most of us feel economically these days. Um, so yes, I think people do uh, sometimes oppose immigration reform um, because I don't want my workers to sort of organize and be legal and I have to pay them more. But I think actually a lot of it, a lot of the opposition is just this, uh, based on this insecurity more generally in the United States. So I, don't, I don't want any more change. I want this change to stop. You know, I'm really uncomfortable with, with where we're going. And this thing called immigration is a big change. So let's stop that kind of change, among other kinds of changes. Well, with your perspective in mind, what would you say us as the immigrant community should uh, do? Like the first step that we should do towards uh, obtaining immigration reform? I think, again, uh, participate with groups like ICIRL.